Welcome to The Liberating Secret with your host, author and teacher, Sylvia Pierce. The Liberating Secret is dedicated to revealing the mystery of the gospel, which is Christ in you, the only hope of glory. Let's join Sylvia Pierce for today's lesson. Hello, welcome to The Liberating Secret. I'm back again and uh, sitting in Sylvia's chair for another uh, show, and uh, I want to tell her thank you for uh, giving me this opportunity, and I, I hope that uh, that some of you might be helped today by what I'm going to share. Um, so, first I want to point out that Sylvia, uh, for those of you that have been watching, she has a book out. For those of you that haven't been watching, I'm going to tell you too, <laughs> that if you know, uh, she has written a new book, and it's called With Wings as Eagles. Uh, it's fabulous. It's a great uh, record or document, if you will, of what Union Life is all about. Uh, really good book form of what she uh, touches on probably week after week, show after show. Uh, so I would advise or I would, I would say get it. Uh, and the good thing about it is uh, you can read it over and over. It's, it's, not, it's not something that you just read and toss to the side. It, it, I think it will continue to uh, speak to you on uh, many readings. I, I, now I'm in the about a fourth of the way through reading it for the second time and it, it's, it seems like a new book to me all of a sudden from before. So it's, it really is that good. So first, and I also want to just inform you for those that might want to check this out. Uh, my name's Louie and I actually do uh, some YouTube videos my, on my own. They're not as uh, maybe as uh, well put together as this. They're a little more humble maybe, <laughs> but it's called the Louie file and you can just go on to Google or uh, any search engine. I, I'm assuming I know through Google you can go on there and just type in the Louie file and, uh, and you'll pull it up and there's several videos there of me sharing five and ten minute biblical insights and uh, testimonies and I, I've just really come to enjoy it. I, I try to make them short uh, some people don't have enough time or maybe don't even want to watch for any longer. And, uh, and you can say a lot in five minutes, I've discovered. So if you would, just watch that. I, I hope it helps you. Um, but today on The Liberating Secret, we're going to, uh, we're going to look in Colossians, uh, Paul's letter to the Colossians. And uh, I've been thinking a lot about this letter recently. And uh, so just a little bit of uh, background. And I... I'm sure there's way more to this than I'm going to share with you, but just to sort of give you a little bit of a understanding of what this letter is about, uh, it seems there was a group of uh, people in this day, in this uh, region of the world that were called what people call Gnostics, and they they claim to have secret knowledge, and, it, and it, you know, there's lots of mysteries that we can discover in the Bible and, and in life about God and the spirit sense, uh, not doubting that a bit. But when you start telling people that there's secret knowledge that they need in order to uh, be right with God, uh, I start having a problem with that. You know, Paul says in the first chapter of Colossians, he said, Behold, I, I show you or reveal you a mystery. He said it was something that had been hidden, but it's now revealed. It has been disclosed. So there's nothing hidden that is in that way necessary for our life to be connected and one with God. So these Gnostics believe that you had to have secret info. And uh, they also, uh, it seems they also taught that Jesus couldn't have been God. Either he couldn't have been God because he was in a flesh body. You know, God can't be in a flesh body. I mean, a flesh body is, is corrupt. Matter is bad and spirit is good. So either he wasn't God or he was in fact God, but he wasn't really human or he wasn't really in a flesh body. I, I read one account that said that some people even claimed that he never touched the earth, that, that it only appeared that he was touching the earth because, well, of course, touching the earth would defile him and that, that can't be right. God can't be defiled by touching the fallen, sinful, material earth. You know, so this, this letter was Paul's way of uh, addressing that. Uh, and with that in mind, you can really see and understand a lot more about this letter. I, it's become more and more open to me, even just as recent as yesterday. So I just want to kind of 
touch on a few verses and a few points here in Colossians. Uh, once again, I'm not going to attempt to read this whole letter. I, I, I would hope you would. And uh, I always want to show you or attempt to show you the scripture as to why I'm uh, saying what I'm saying. And I, I've told people many times that you can disagree with me. That's fine. But I would really like for you to disagree with me by way of the scripture. So if you disagree with my view of it, that's fine, but don't make it just because you don't like it or because it's your opinion. <laughs> make it because you have a, another view of the scripture and then, then we'll, we'll see how that works. But so Colossians of course starts with Paul introducing himself and how he was apostle by the will of Christ. And uh, that's the way he kind of introduces all of his letters. And he starts off saying, how he, you know, he's given thanks to God and he's, he's so thankful for them and that their faith and their love and their hope is, is coming to him and he's realizing how much of it they have and he prays for them that they would be filled up with spiritual wisdom. And then he starts talking about what Christ has actually done. In uh, Colossians 1.13, it says he rescued us uh, or delivered us from the domain of darkness. Wow, so he, he pulled us out of darkness and he transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. So God has done this. Uh, he rescued us. We didn't pull ourselves up <laughs> by our own bootstraps, trying harder and all that. He rescued us. And he has given us forgiveness of sins in his son. So then he starts talking about the son. He starts talking about Jesus. And he said, he's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Whoa, firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He's before all things. In him all, all things hold together. He's also head of the body of the church. He's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will have come to, come to have first place in everything. So right here, he starts right off saying all of creation, even material creation, was created by him, for him, through him, right? Earthly, visible, invisible. So he starts right off <laughs> dealing with this, <laughs> this false understanding by saying, what do you mean matter is bad? Matter is not bad. Matter in and of itself is not bad. Dirt's not bad. Human bodies in themselves are not bad. That's, that's not really our problem. And God becoming a man, although it's, it's uh, mind boggling in a sense to think that God, you know, became a, a little baby through Mary. I mean, that, that is, it's, it's a, it's something that your mind can't comprehend, but your spirit goes, yes, yes. <laughs> I mean, we were made in his image. We fell as human beings, so God himself had to come as a human. He had to be here as a human to restore fallen humans. And in verse 19, Colossians 1, 19, it says, For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him. So all of who God is dwelt in Christ. And it says, And through him, through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross, through him. I say whether things on earth or things in heaven. See, he keeps bringing up earth, right? He keeps bringing up uh, flesh. He keeps bringing up earthly stuff. And look at this, verse 21. And although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds. Now, verse 22. This verse really jumped at me yesterday. Yet he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. How about that? Our reconciliation to God requires it to take place in Christ's fleshly body. <laughs> so these Gnostics were saying he didn't have a flesh body. He was a spirit being, and that's it. God can't become flesh. That would corrupt God. And Paul's saying the exact opposite. He's saying, no, if what you're saying is true, then we're not reconciled and our salvation is not, we're doomed because it took Christ's fleshly body. It took a fleshly human body dying on that cross in order to rescue us from this domain of darkness. So humanity is lost forever if humanity in Christ did not restore it. 
This is, this is what the whole story is about. God's image was in man. Man fell. His image was corrupted. So Christ comes, the exact representation, the fullness of God in bodily form. He goes to the cross as all of humanity, all of us, put our faith in that death, burial, and resurrection. We believe that to, to be us that died and was raised back. And now we live a new life, but we're still in flesh bodies. It, it's kind of interesting. Um, in Galatians 2.20, Paul says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives. It's Christ who liveth. And then he says, the life which I now live in the flesh or in the body, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So Paul is saying, I'm still in a body. <laughs> I'm still in flesh as a human being. You know, this word flesh gets a little bit confusing sometimes in the scripture, I think. Uh, it does have a little bit of different connotations to it. You know, we think of flesh in one instance as the meat on our bones, and that, and that would be right. You know, in the Old Testament, uh, God wiped out all flesh except for Noah. So it, I, I kind of come to this definition that has helped me more than others, and that is when I think of the term flesh, I think of our humanity, and when you think of it in a negative sense, it would be our humanity attempting to operate apart from the Spirit of God. So it would be a uh, self-will, it would be a self-effort type willpower uh, kind of thing that we, we can do this thing in our own strength. That would be, you know, in the flesh. Um, but that's not exactly what we're talking about here. We're talking about humanity, just humanity, just pure humanity. We're not talking about good or evil per se. We're talking about humanity that in Christ's flesh and his humanity he reconciled us even though we were alienated separated and we were even hostile <laughs> we've had a hostile attitude you know sometimes I like to tell people it's not just that we were fallen or that we had sin that separated us we were actually at war with God it was as though we were in battle against him so he took that person that was angry and hostile and alienated and and he he reconciled that person. So we put our faith in that. We put, place our faith in that reconciliation, which could only be made possible through his fleshly body through death. So then, as you go on in Colossians 1, you start to see Paul saying that he rejoiced in his sufferings, that he came to see himself as an intercessor for the body of Christ, and he said he rejoiced in it. Verse 24, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake and in my flesh, I do my share on behalf of his body, which is the church, and filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. So Paul is telling us that Christ in his body bore our troubles and our sins and our sicknesses to reconcile us. And now since he's been reconciled, he says, you know what, I, I'm going to rejoice to join into that suffering uh, in my body on behalf of Christ's body, which is the church. So he saw himself as is participating in this and uh, you know this he says uh, filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions now don't misunderstand this Christ's death burial and resurrection his shed blood is what saves us that's what cleanses us that's what deals with our sins and we have no part in that that's his blood and that's his role all by himself we are not co-saviors in that sense but we are joined in his death. And then after we really see that and we see ourselves as being raised and walking joined one with him, we start to uh, become more and more willing to take on suffering on behalf of others. And, and the reason I think is because the suffering servant of Christ himself now dwells in us. <laughs> his nature is to serve others. His nature is to take it on the chin for others. His nature is to die uh, for others that, that others might live. So Paul's personality and his, uh, his expression of Christ is coming out in this way. And then he says in verse 25, of this church, this, this church that I'm, I'm, being, I'm taking this suffering on behalf of, I was made a minister according to the stewardship from God bestowed on me for your benefit so that I might fully carry out the preaching of the word of God that is the mystery which has been hidden 
from the past ages and generations, but has now been made manifested to his saints. So Paul's telling us right here, there was a mystery, but it's been revealed. Once again, the Gnostics were believing in some kind of mysterious knowledge, and if you, did, you weren't in with their mysterious knowledge, well then, tough luck, you were just out. And so Paul is saying, no, this mystery is revealed. And then he tells us what it is. The mystery is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So God became a man, suffered, and died as a man on the cross, and that by his fleshly body he reconciled us. Now he has moved into us. We now join into some of the same types of suffering. But him, Christ in us, gives, gives us back the hope of glory. So just as God became flesh in Jesus, now he is, he is operating through our flesh, through our humanity, and then we are now becoming his representative. Um, up in verse 19, it said it was the Father's good pleasure for all his fullness to dwell in him, in, in Christ. We're going to discover here in a minute that his fullness still dwells in Christ, and now, his, now Christ is dwelling in us. So the fullness of who God is is dwelling in you if, you if you have Christ in you. And that's the hope of glory. It's a hope of restoration. It's full restoration. And he says, moving on now, Colossians 1.28, We proclaim him, admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom, so that we may present every man complete or perfect in Christ. And he said, For this purpose I labor, striving according to his power, which mightily works within me. So Paul's whole mission, his whole uh, uh, goal, everything that God had called him to do was to preach Christ crucified so that we could receive Christ in us, so the hope of glory would be restored in man, we would be made whole in him, <laughs> lacking nothing. That's an amazing thing. You know, when you receive Christ, you have all you need. Uh, lots of people don't see that or don't want to see that, but if I am born again, if I'm born from above and Christ is joined to my spirit, if I mean, he that's joined to the Lord is one spirit, if that's true, what could I possibly need outside of that? Ephesians chapter 1 tells us that we've been blessed with all spiritual or every spiritual blessing in, in Christ. So there you have it. It's a package deal. So Paul's saying, look, I'm proclaiming him and presenting every man perfect in him. So then you move on into Colossians 2, and, and he's, he starts off kind of with a little prayer about there's a struggle that's been going on in uh, the, those that are at Laodicea and all those that haven't seen him by face, that their hearts would be encouraged and been knit together and all of these things. So he says, uh, verse 2, that their hearts may be encouraged, having been knit together in love and attaining to all the wealth that comes from the full assurance of understanding, resulting in a true knowledge of God's mystery, that is Christ himself, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. <laughs> so there he goes again. He's saying, look, the Gnostics are trying to get you involved in some knowledge, some mysterious secret wisdom, but I'm telling you that in Christ is hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Everything you need, every bit of insight and revelation is all wrapped up in Christ. So this whole letter is one point after another of Paul uh, combating or answering this, this uh, problem that these Gnostics had brought in. You know, there's no shortage of cults or people or groups of you know uh, religious groups i mean they're they're everywhere they're everywhere that are always trying to uh, deny or reject or add to or take away from the simplicity that's in christ I, so i always like to break it down really clear that in adam we're all fallen but in christ we're all raised and so that's really what it comes down to god's looking at all across humanity and he's saying you know what there's only two groups of people out here those that are in adam dead in sin <laughs> and those that are in Christ alive to righteousness that that pretty much is it and in between the two is the cross so that that's the simplest way of seeing it to me so he goes on to say I'm telling you that all this wisdom and knowledge is in Christ because I don't want anyone to delude you with persuasive arguments don't get led astray by someone's uh, great 
intellectual philosophy that takes you away from Christ and what he is really all about. It's all in Christ. Come back, focus on Christ. He's where the, the hope of glory is. He's where the wisdom and knowledge is. So he says uh, in Colossians 2, 5, he says, Even though I'm absent in body, nevertheless I'm with you in spirit. So then verse 6, he says, Therefore, as you have received Christ, Jesus, the Lord, so walk in him. I love this verse. I always ask people, I say, well, how did you receive Christ? And they say, by faith. And I said, well, then how are you going to walk in them? <laughs> and they say, by faith. Now, isn't it? That's just so great. It's, I mean, I just get, it's like a deep breath of rest when I think about that because it's not a complicated thing. It's not this secret thing over here and trying to understand that over there. It's just, you know what? I received Christ by faith. I said, Lord, I need you. And without you, I'm doomed. And he goes, that's right. You know, so he moves into me and then it stays that simple. <laughs> it's still that simple. I just wake up in the morning and I just know he's in me <clears throat> and I walk in him. <clears throat> Excuse me. So in verse eight, Colossians two, eight, he says, see to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception, according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. So there's all sorts of new ideas all the time flooding the marketplace. I was in a bookstore the other day and I was amazed at how many different spiritual books, religious books there. I mean, they're everywhere. It's stuff I've never even heard of before, but you know what? Tomorrow there'll be another one you've never even heard of before because there's always a new one on the market and people will buy it and the person is going to become wealthy and it's all a bunch of confusing stuff that doesn't really give you any life. So he's, t he's warning us here, don't get caught up in that. And then he drops this bomb on us, Colossians 2, 9 and 10. He says, for in him, that's Christ, all the fullness of deity or the Godhead dwells in bodily form. In bodily form, in humanity, all of the Godhead dwelt in humanity in Christ. He told us. Uh, he told Philip, I think it was in John 14, John 14, I think he said, show us the father. And Jesus said, how long have I been with you? <laughs> he said, if you've seen me, you've seen the father. I mean, that's an amazing statement, don't you think? So the father was expressing himself through Jesus humanity and all of what God is and, and who he is was, it was in Christ in bodily form. And then here's where we're joined in. In verse 10, it says, and in him, you have been made complete. So in him, all of the Godhead dwelt in bodily form, and in him, if we're in him, then we're made whole and complete. And he's the head over all rule and authority. And then we get into another deep thought here. In verse 11, it says, And in him you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands in the removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised up with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. Wow. So, right there it says, In him we were circumcised with a circumcision not by hands, but it was also a circumcision or removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. The sinful body, the sinful um, producer was removed from us uh, through the flesh death, the bodily death of Christ on the cross. You know, in Romans 8, it says that Christ condemned sin in the flesh. I, thought, I always thought that was a very interesting way of wording that because most of us think that he condemned flesh. He didn't say that, though. He condemned sin in the flesh. You see, the flesh in and of itself is weak, but it's not evil and it's not righteous. <laughs> it is the dwelling place of one maybe who is evil or one who might be righteous. But the dwelling place itself, our bodies, is not evil. The Gnostics thought it was. God came in a body, in a flesh body. And it says actually in the likeness of sinful flesh. He was in flesh, but he wasn't sinful. So that's how he was able to take in our sin 
and give us his righteousness. There was this great exchange by way of the cross. So this whole idea of the flesh being cut off the, is, I think what he's saying here is the flesh effort, the humanity trying, attempting to operate on its own. That old man is gone. That so-called independent guy that we were. <laughs> So then he, uh, he made us alive together with Christ. He's raised us back up. Now there's so much more to be said probably about this. Uh, perhaps we'll have to leave that for another time. But I hope this has helped you so far. Um, Christ was God manifest in the flesh. And now that Christ is in us, in, in human bodies, he is still manifesting himself in humanity as, as a human. It's, a, it's a, a remarkable plan from a remarkable God. How else can an invisible spirit that is God reveal himself except through a visible human to express himself through? We are the visible expression of the invisible God, all because Christ dwells in us. <laughs> all right. Thanks for watching The Liberating Secret. Maybe I'll see you one more time. See you later. I hope that you are being blessed by The Liberating Secret. If you would like to have for yourself my books, booklets, or any of my TV or radio series, check out our website's bookstore. Our TV shows are also on our YouTube site. And be sure to get The Liberating Secret app for your phone. We have an annual Louisville conference in June, as well as a biannual Woman's Retreat at Polly's Island, South Carolina. Come for a weekend or a week of study, fun, fellowship by the ocean. We also have a weekly Bible study. See our website for times and location. My husband and Scott and I would love to come and share the liberating truth to your fellowship, church, or home group. Please call or contact us through the website. If you would like to donate to our ministry, make your checks out to Christ Our Life Ministries, Post Office Box 43268, Louisville, Kentucky, 40253. Please pray for us, and we will pray God's very best for you.